Right. Okay then. Yes. Right. Hello everyone. Have fun. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for bearing with us while we sorted out all the technical details. Um, looking forward to the session. Education is a topic close to my heart, very, very close to my heart. I should say I'm Tanya Johnston. I'll be chairing the session this afternoon. We're going to start with a presentation from Terry O'Connor and Tamarin Godinho, uh, who are going to present about the education journal Science in Schools. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I mean, if you want to start a presentation, then I can just do my the, better, the best thing is if, if you present and then when you're done, you close and I'll Yeah, no, I'm you. sorry. I will need to go slightly. Ah, so okay, so I should start from your slides. Hold on, hold on, hold yes, on. Please. Okay. And apologies, I have a steering committee meeting with a whole bunch of senior scientists who are never available. So you take the opportunity when you get it. Mm -hmm. uh, so am I sharing now? Yep. Okay, so you just tell me when I should click. Uh, if you can make it a presenter mode. Oh, is it not? Oh, sorry. Okay. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much. Um, you notice that we say in the slides it's on behalf of IRO Forum, um, the eight members of the <coughs> European Intergovernmental Research Organization Forum. Um, who fund and um, publish the magazine. So next. Move on. I'm trying the slide thing is not going for some reason. Oh, there. Is that one too far? That's one too far. It's being slow. Ah, so first off, uh, yeah, so X and Y science in school. Um, so very quickly, um, as you probably know, the RO forum members cover the whole range of STEM research disciplines from the very smallest um, to the very largest and across all of the disciplines. There's even some social science and humanities involved as well. Um, supporting STEM education is obviously a priority, um, both as the right thing to do, but also because it's expected by our member states. And since 26, 2006, originally with European funding, uh, but then self-funded through the IRO Forum contributions, this magazine has been run as a print publication. Um, a review found that up to 200,000 readers, I don't know what the, relevant, what the uh, source of that was, but it certainly, we know that it was reasonably well received uh, and it's been regularly reviewed. But in the last few years, uh, it was obvious that there were some cost constraints and some uh, production problems arising. Um, it was published as print, and then eventually it became print with a digital version, uh, and that was starting to uh, starting to create some some issues. Um, next, please. I'm sorry, it's really just not responding well. It's the heat. Mm. <laughs> Um, so there are some challenges in producing, this is the reason we thought this might be of interest to everybody else, there are some challenges, obviously, um, to be of use in the classroom, it has to be relevant to the curriculum. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a sales job for the IRO forum members, it, it has to, if it's going to be worth doing, you should do it properly, if you can't do it properly, don't do it at all. Uh, so that was a very key decision uh, by the task force, which included Tanya actually and myself, um, in relation to the review that we recently did. Um, there is no European curriculum. In some countries, there is no national curriculum, in which case sticking to an agreed curriculum becomes very difficult, um, which I think Tamron, we're very lucky to have Tamron and uh, um, her offsider Rosaria, who uh, have made sense out of chaos, um, well, are trying to make sense out of chaos. Um, the other thing that we are very conscious of is that there's a limit to what teachers would find useful, and you are not a teacher of STEM generally, you're a teacher of biology or chemistry or engineering or physics. And so it has to be relevant to you, relevant to the curriculum and relevant in a classroom. Uh, and also this isn't the IRO's day job. They're established as, uh, we are established as research organizations, not as secondary education uh, organizations. And the directors general realized that it needed dedicated support because otherwise it becomes, oh yes, that's a nice to do and we won't put the effort in. And it comes back to that point, if you're going to do it, it has to be done properly. Um, next. 
Uh, that was weird. Um, we, the review, certainly there were several reviews uh, which have fed into another. Uh, teaching student preferences are evolving, much more use of digital. Uh, you do find some people say, I like print. Uh, from other examples, we know not just relation to this, that in fact, yes, for, for some primary schools, for example, they do like print because they actually still physically get the kids to cut things out with scissors. Uh, in secondary, which is the target audience for us, that's less the case. Costs were escalating. So frankly, again, if we we're going to do it, we needed to do it properly, but we couldn't do it if we couldn't afford it. And therefore, we, we came to the conclusion that print was unsustainable, but unsustainable in environmental terms and unsustainable in cost. Uh, EMBL has just moved, for example, to a completely digital annual report. Um, we had steadily reduced the number we printed every year because we were clear that people weren't necessarily receiving the hard copy. Uh, and we saved 212,000 pages of printing just by going digital, uh, plus about 30,000 euro. Uh, so there was an assessment uh, by an educational consultant, then followed by a review by the task force. Uh, we agreed a digital only model with a revamped management, much clearer streamlined management. Uh, Tamron's title is executive editor. We hired her to do the job. We trust her to do the job. We get out of the way. Um, we provide oversight and um, I think that's about it. I think 10 years, isn't it? I mean, uh, if you are, that's the other message that I think we would deliver on this is that if you are going to do this, layers of additional oversight simply complicate matters and end up, I think, screwing up the end product. Um, so it is a new team. Uh, it's a new product. And I think, uh, Tamron, you take over from this point because what we really wanted to do was just provide you an opportunity for Tamron to give her experiences of in effect, taking an established resource for teachers, but then turning it digital and revamping it to meet more modern requirements. And I think there's been some really, really interesting outcomes from that. And I think she and Zara have done a fabulous job. So over to you. So I was, I'm actually mostly going to talk a little bit about our content and and how we get it and how it ties into the to the sort of goals of research organisations and research infrastructures and how we, you know, and also goals of, of science engagement and communication. So when I took over, the pipeline was essentially empty. This was, we were sort of starting from fresh and we had to have a, a new approach of, of what our content was, be, was going to be and how we're going to get it. And I'm going to briefly talk about some of those. But um, just a, a point from our mission statement, which is that we should always have in mind that the, the goal is to foster positive attitudes towards the science that shapes our lives and attract students to careers in these fields. And I think that the first one is in some ways even more important than the second. It's not just the next generation of scientists, but the next generation of citizens who are going to be deciding on things like vaccination that we really need to, need to capture. So to this end, we have three article types. And I'll talk a little bit about each type because they have kind of different than different considerations. So Terry already mentioned that teachers are very time poor and things need to need to fit into their curriculum. So we have these inspire articles which are aimed at teachers that are often about teaching or teaching resources. So you can see this one here was on the art of demon science demonstration. Um, I included this one just to draw your attention to the little flags here. So we do actually support translation. We are not able to do translation ourselves into every European language. There's obviously not the budget for that. But volunteers can volunteer to translate articles and we facilitate getting it checked by someone else in that language and then upload it. And this particular one has a lot of translations, not all of them have so many, because this was chosen. Um, we upload our articles on Scientix and this was chosen. It was voted for by their members as the best article in a particular category. And then we got professional translation for this one. But otherwise, we allow translation and these inspire articles can also be used to feature the sort of educational offerings from the, the IRO teams themselves. So there's the second example is from the ELS team in EMBL. They have this new microscope in action activity and we we're able to feature that. The sec the, another article type we have are teach articles. And given what Terry said about how everything needs to fit with the curriculum and how time poor teachers are, these are our most popular articles from the teacher's point of view. These are typically classroom activities. They're described in a step-by-step -step manner. They're theoretically maybe the article type that are furthest away from cutting edge research, but we can still try and make sure that they have 
they sort of engage students by having real world relevance like this. Our superfoods really so super allowed students to test, say, the vitamin C content and various nutrient contents in various superfoods and compare them. We're also then able to feature the, the IROS educational contributions. So here's an article from ESA landing on the moon about, um, yeah, using the laws of physics to land an egg safely from a height. And in all of these articles, we make sure that in the article text themselves, there are links to how this links into curriculum topics and how these can be used. And then something nice that we can also do that is maybe not so easy for other popular science magazines is that we can really then use our access to, to people who have done research and know how research works to have articles on the research process itself and not just the science. So this last one is one I'm particularly proud of that I was quite involved with, which was about what is it good for basic versus applied research. And it's basically a role play where we worked from the, from the COVID vaccine backwards to look at all of the scientific advances over decades that have allowed it to, that contributed to this and made it possible. And then different scientists wrote research uh, funding proposals based on these scientific projects and a lot of these projects initially struggled to get funding like projects on stabilizing uh, nucleic acids and then it's a role play where the students are divided into funders and scientists and the scientists get their card and have to justify to the funders why they should get money and the whole class has to decide in the end how the money should be distributed and then at the end they get additional information cards on each project to show what these projects finally allowed to happen just to sort of explain a little bit about the, the importance of basic research. So that's something nice that we can do that is maybe not so possible for other, for other kinds of publications due to our closeness to, to people doing research. And then the final article type, which is probably the most of most, interesting, of most interest to communications teams are the understand articles. And whereas the teach and inspire articles are aimed only at teachers to help them teach their classes, the idea with the understand articles is that they should be articles that teachers can take into the classroom and show to their students and discuss with their students too. So some of them are just information about important topics like this one on vaccines. They can be, again, we can focus on, on how research is done and important themes and, and topics and issues in research. So this one is organ on chip systems and about trying to, to minimize animals in research. But, but, but it was still a balanced article that explained why animals are used in research and why they can be necessary. And then we can also feature then work that is being done by scientists at some of the IROs. And this first one was from a professor in Liverpool who's working with CERN on all sorts of, sort of new options for radiotherapy. And he wrote a really nice article on this, sort of linking it into to Star Wars, since that's a, that's a favorite theme of his. And this last one was written by a PhD student at EMBL and was on the whole alpha fold development and, and why it's so difficult to predict protein folding and why this is interesting. And with those last two, I've already hinted at where we get where we get these articles or how the articles come about. I'll just briefly mention that in the previous model, the main IRO research results were in a single article every issue that were a kind of roundup of essentially press releases. So there'd be a single article with a news result from every IRO, and these were actually our least used articles because it just wasn't clear to teachers what they should do with them. So it's nicer if we can get some of the IRA research into a full article that explains the whole background to something that they can take into their classrooms. So, and it's not, not responding again. <laughs> Where did the articles come from? Unfortunately, they don't fall from the sky. The stalk doesn't bring them. But um, mostly I would say the process is less, <laughs> less painful than where babies come from. We have we publish five articles a year. There's six here because it's over two years, but five articles a year, sorry, issues a year. We do still publish in issues because it's a nice excuse to send a newsletter out to all of our subscribers saying, hey, we have a great new issue, come and have a look. And uh, in terms of how we fill these issues, the articles are all written by, or almost all written by volunteers, by either teachers or scientists. Teachers is not maybe of such an interest to this audience, but in terms of where we get the understand articles written by scientists, these are mostly just people I approach and ask if they'd like to write something. We might find them, they might be recommended by the IROs to us, or we find some interesting news on the IRO, on the, from the IRO's own pages, or sometimes there'll be an interesting blog or a talk, or I see something at a conference, and then I'll go to the 
the scientist and ask whether they'd like to be involved. And obviously these people are not writers. They are often not even native speakers. And so we need to provide what I like to refer to as full editorial support. And this looks a little bit like this. So if we ignore everything forward of the draft deadline for a minute, the first step is then to obviously contact the researchers and to discuss what kind of content will go in the article. At this stage, we also give them our article template and our article guidelines and a bunch of example articles and try and then help them come up with something that makes sense within our, our word limit, which is a thousand words for these articles. Then they write a draft and send it to us, and we need the draft a minimum three months before publication because of this long process due to the fact that they need a lot of a lot of editorial support. So this this second step here of editorial review and revision is probably the most important step because quite a lot of the articles we receive are either much too complex and they, they assume far too much background knowledge. They're essentially written like scientific like like scientific articles. So then we have to write back and say, well, look, nobody actually knows. The audience doesn't know what preclinical studies are. They don't know what viral vectors are. We need to look at these. Th these are the terms, and we need to decide which ones are key. And the ones that are key to the message, we keep in and explain. And the ones that are not key to the message, we take out and find another way of describing. Other people go the other way and get so caught up in trying to write a popular science article that they write an article that's very superficial and none of the statements are backed up by any scientific citations and it's just sort of their personal opinion and then we try to guide them towards do you have an example for this or do you have more details on how this happens and often they're also very unstructured so then we help them find a good structure with subheadings that to guide the reader through what point this article is trying to make and Quite often at this stage, I then, you know, I go through with my editor's red pen or my editor's comments and track changes and send it back to the article completely smothered in comments with a long email full of things that needs cha need changing. And what I'm essentially asking for without doing it directly is a complete rewrite. Sometimes if the authors are really struggling to understand, I'll do what I like to call active editing and do a bit of a rewrite myself. And I was initially a little bit concerned about how they might take this, given that these are volunteers who are freely giving up their time to write articles for us. It's not like publishing a scientific paper where it's something they have to do for their career. But I was surprised in that people are generally, the, the, the researchers are really keen to be involved and really delighted to get impact, input on their articles and are excited to see how the articles develop and super excited to see them published in the end. So there've often been authors where I've thought, okay, I've really given this person a hard time. I've asked them for four different revisions and they are going to be so relieved when this is over and never going to want to hear from me again. And then as soon as it's published, we get an email saying, that was great. What about the next article? And this is really the, the one of the really awesome parts of my job is getting to, to then work with these scientists who are so enthusiastic to share their, their work. And this ties into something that came up in talks yesterday in that scientists are supposed to be doing more communication and a lot of them would really like to. I was at the Euroscience Forum last week and there was a whole session on people doing science communication research. So really looking into the, si the data of science communication and a couple of them from different countries, including Sweden, the UK and Germany had done huge surveys of scientists trying to figure out what communication they do and how much and you know what how they feel about it. And almost across the board, all, all levels of science and in all three countries, most scientists were saying they would like to be doing more communication. <laughs> and then when they asked about what the barriers were to this, one of them was obviously lack of time, but one that came up again and again is that they're just not sure how to start or don't feel that they have any training. I mean, having a blog or a YouTube channel is a lot of work. Not everyone wants to roll up their sleeves and wade into the arguments on vaccination and the flat earth on Twitter. And it's not clear to a lot of scientists how they can get involved in communication, although they'd really like to. So they're usually really, really pleased to, to get involved and to have this support in writing something. And especially for early career scientists, this should be something that's mutually beneficial for, for us and for the scientists working at the, at the IROs and at other research organizations, because this is, some, this is a way that they can get into communication, they can have support doing it, they can have guidance on writing for a non-specialist audience. It's training, it's something they can put on their CV if they're students, and that's something I'd like to do more of now that travel is possible again, is to go to the IROs and speak to their PhD students and encourage them to get involved. 
because it seems to be something that's quite quite positive for for both sides. And then, do I have another few minutes, or is that just a minute or so? Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the last exciting. thing is just something that also came up this morning is that we sort of have in mind that in, that the the issue, especially when talking to students, the issue of inclusion is extremely important, and it's just difficult to figure out how to get this in because obviously most of our audience our articles are aimed at teachers, not students, and it has to be something the teacher would actually then take into their class. We have had articles on this, so this is a recent article on how to make um, science practical lessons more inclusive for people of different abilities. But um, then it occurred to us that since we have this link to, to researchers directly, especially from the IROs and the value of research organizations is not just in the science they produce, but in their scientists, this is an opportunity to then ask them for, for pictures of themselves and their colleagues doing their work and to sort of sneak this message into the understand articles that science is for everyone. So this is something that we also try and do and would like to be to be doing more of. Right. That, that was my last minute. <laughs> Thank you, Tamron. Thank you, Terry. You're if I could, uh, just, uh, unfortunately, I do apologize, but if I could just say, uh, as you can see, Cameron and Rosario have put a lot of thought into how this works. And the key message I would deliver to us as a group and ask you to take out more widely is that final point she was making about inclusion, but also about getting more researchers to do communication. I think there is a, a, a false impression that you have to stand up yourself and do something. If you can use your expertise and knowledge as a researcher and create a really meaningful, useful tool for teachers in a classroom, you will have much more impact and much more lasting impact than you would standing up in front of a group of people who pay to attend a science, a science you know, talk, for example. They're already committed to science. You're influencing the future if you do this. So we, you know, we, the IRAs provide this tool uh, specifically for teachers, we are, as Tamron said, we we want more input from people. So there are other similar, other magazines also exist. But don't forget when you're talking to your researchers, it isn't just about doing public lectures or social media. If you can contribute to the education programs, that I think has a much greater impact. Thank you. Okay, sorry, well, I do apologize. Uh, <laughs> briefly. Um, if it's okay with you, Tamarin, I would suggest that we save the questions till the end and we go through all the other talks first. Um, is that fine, Tamarin? Have you got a used to able to stay all good till then? Okay, great. So our next speaker is Nicoletta, who is also online, and I see she's ready already. Yes. Thank you, Nicoletta. Hello, um, everyone. So I'll give you the floor as well, Nicoletta. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Nicoletta Carboni. I'm from Seri Keric. Uh, we already met with some of you, with some others not. And I work in the communication office of uh, the consortium. And today, let me share my screen here. I would like to present uh, an example of uh, practice of empowerment of high school pupils at research infrastructures, which is that of the PAGES project. This is a project that we have implemented in the last uh, seven, eight years uh, in uh, seven high schools in the Italian region, Friuli Venezia Giulia. And the goal is to accompany them through, uh, um, through a whole uh, experiment uh, at our research laboratories, from the planning of the experiment through to the management of it, the execution, the evaluation, up to the dissemination of the results. Why here do I speak about empowerment? Because the goal it uh, goes beyond the, the scientific uh, training, and we would also like uh, to give additional uh, elements uh, and uh, insights about the different careers that are available in a research infrastructures. So going beyond that of the scientists, um, allowing the students to orient themselves in the future choices for their academic studies and uh, for for their careers and we remember when we were kids uh, in schools we not necessarily knew all the uh, career opportunities that they would be outside after we ended uh, our our school studies um 
just a moment because okay yes so to present some numbers about the the project uh, this as i mentioned uh, we ended this year the seventh uh, seventh editions there were five research infrastructures involved this includes also the partner facilities of seric um seven different schools we in a uh, couple of editions we also involved a private company which actually produces undulators for uh, synchrotrons and uh, laser, fa laser facilities. And they were there to speak about uh, technology transfer and knowledge transfer. We also invited the bank. Uh, I will tell you why later. And we uh, reached over, um, well, um, over 600 uh, pupils who were trained both in the classrooms and in the lab. More than 50 scientists uh, have been involved. Uh, in addition, also around 10 people with, from a different, uh, with a different background, a non-scientific background, were involved in the training. And four editions were confounded by the Italian region, Fiori Venezia Giulia, and later CERIC has decided to continue with its ordinary funds. Now we would like to see if we can continue with additional funding uh, in the future, possibly also extending it to some citizen science project. And that's why if in the case any of you is involved in any citizen science project, uh, I would be very glad to listen to your experience even uh, next to this presentation on Slack or in through other channels. So this project, as I mentioned before, so it included the, the theoretical part on particle accelerators and specifically on the experiment that was chosen for a, the specific classes. And this was done both in the classroom and then later uh, the pupils came in the different uh, beam lines, uh, different laboratories, uh, experimenting different techniques at our basic, mainly in, our, in the synchrotron that is in Trieste, which is our Italian partner facilities. And uh, here are listed some of the topics that have been addressed. So from carbon nanotubes to metal nanoparticles and their application in, in uh, biotechnology, uh, also something related to cultural heritage or microfabrication micro and, and more. I'm not going to list them all here. Uh, then we linked this, uh, so the experimental part, which uh, um, gathered, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the data collection, the data analysis up to the, uh, to the interpretation of the data and uh, the basic elements on how to write a scientific article. Then we link this to other activities uh, and uh, and topics <clears throat> linked to science communication and corporate communication, and specifically this was uh, um, was shaped in a way that they could um, also collect a set of tools to then present uh, their their work throughout the project to an audience uh, uh, in their schools, so to other classrooms in their in their schools, and also to some representatives, uh, institutional representatives, and uh, uh, other professors from those schools. Then they um, were trained, they were given some elements of uh, industrialism and technology transfer, which are like uh, Arabic for them. They don't, most of them don't, do not know about this. So we gave some hints on what it, what, what that means and uh, uh, what does a technology transfer officer does in a uh, in a research infrastructure. So this is also a career that they may not uh, know and which may inspire them for, for their future. Also, uh, there was a whole set of uh, lectures which were also practical, uh, focused on project management. Uh, and here it was very important to speak to them and to ask them what are their interests? What, uh, uh, do they have any any project in mind uh, that could be even you know a, a music uh, a band that is also a project so anything could be a project so start, starting from that uh, the theory uh, was linked to their own uh, ideas and projects um, so they had also to prepare uh, using the tools basic tools of project management uh, the, uh, the the schedule for for its implementation and then there were also lectures on business planning and also on pitching and public speaking. And the bank was involved, uh, the bank, a representative of a bank was invited so that he could then evaluate the best uh, pitch 
for a future funding. This was, of, of course, it was fictional. They didn't receive, actually, of course, with, with some fundings, external fundings, it would be nice to, to make uh, a real entrepreneurial project uh, happen. Uh, but in this case, it was fictional, but it was interesting because they had a direct contact uh, with the reality, with, uh, with, uh, with what would happen if they really were looking for funding for their own project. Um, then uh, they had, uh, they, they went, as I mentioned before, there was this dissemination activities. Here are just some, some flyers that they produced. Uh, and here, uh, the, the, the message to them during the lectures was be creative, use all the tools that you have in mind, all the knowledge, all, uh, starting from your passions. Do you, uh, do you like to design a website? Do you like to make a video? Are you doing theater? Do you play? What, 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 is, what do you do outside of the schools? And they were extremely creative because they created videos, also fictional ones, uh, going first, they, in, in some cases, they interviewed the scientists and then uh, either they included the real interview of the scientists or they played as actors as if they were the real scientists and, uh, and used their, their replies. They produced magazines, brochures, they built uh, 3D models of the instruments that they, that they found in the synchrotron. And then they brought this uh, also in, uh, not only in the public events in the schools, but also at science fairs that were in, in which their school uh, attended, that their school attended. But then there was a, a question, what do we do during the pandemic? Should we freeze this project? Should we stop? And the schools really were really willing to continue. Uh, so we decided uh, to, to make, uh, well, before having it hybrid, we had to go fully online. So fortunately, there were very good, uh, especially PhD students and researchers who were very keen on uh, taking part. So they, uh, in part, they pre-recorded part of the experiments and uh, they, and we organized uh, remote sessions in which they they accompanied the students through 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 all the the steps of the experiments and in that year we specifically focused on covid related research so to to make uh, really to link to the present to what was really happening in that moment even if the media were quite uh, overwhelmed with uh, such kind of information but we thought that this could be a good focus for for that year edition um, then we, we had the collaboration also of CERN and uh, in the same, this was the first year of the pandemic and they offered to, uh, to a virtual tour uh, and their the response was extremely positive from all the schools and the, and the pupils themselves. So the year after, which is actually this year um, in which we cannot, still we cannot uh, host uh, big groups in our facilities. We also have virtual tours through our facilities, through different instruments, uh, presenting, making them simple. So we didn't go through all steps of an experiment, but just presented the technique and the possible applications uh, to make, um, to, to ensure that we didn't lose interest from pupils who are quite uh, tired of uh, having uh, online online uh, classes. And then also last year, uh, in terms of communication, since there were, there were lectures specifically on communi science communication or corporate communication, the choice was to have uh, a focus on fake news and, and to go, let's say, to provide pupils with the tools to recognize uh, fake news and disinformation to learn how to debunk the news, um, verify them, fact check them. And, and actually the response was that uh, by the pupils was that this kind of uh, courses would be very uh, useful uh, in any moment, let's say, of the, of the, of the school path uh, and also for other, other students not necessarily attending the, the program of this project. So this was very, very well welcomed. So to know more about the project, you can find the training materials from the past editions in our website. And I don't know how much time I have, but I think this is probably the most interesting part, hopefully, uh, about the challenges and the lessons learned. 
these are just some of the challenges because certainly there are more. As mentioned before by Terry, it's very important to in the in the planning phase to link to the curricula of the schools. Here I didn't mention, but we are speaking of uh, pupils of 16 to 18 years old, more or less. So uh, they did some. Uh, of course, they, they are from scientific high schools, so they are more advanced than other curricula. But uh, it's important to. Uh, customize uh, to shape the program in a way that is understandable on the basis of the program that they have uh, studied up to that moment. It is important, scientists are very, very happy to take part, but uh, we have to remind that there are, they have uh, users, uh, other researchers coming to the facilities to carry out experiments and they need to support them. So we need to plan the whole program in a way to not interfere with their activities. And it's not that trivial as it may seem. Uh, then, uh, then it happened that the project usu usually ended around May uh, of each year, and that's quite late. So we had to anticipate because by that time students have their final exams, especially if they are in the last year of the school. Uh, so we needed to anticipate all 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 the various uh, activities to end in March, April uh, at the latest. They make the science simple, <laughs> simple enough uh, for them to, to to understand and to ensure that they are that they are that they keep uh, their interest and attention because it's not we are not going there to perform and show them how much we know but we would like to give some inspiration and curiosity to them, so it's better to to do less and simpler let's say not making it trivial but uh, uh, keeping it simple. Uh, and also to train uh, to train the teachers because they do not necessarily know uh, specifically what we do at our infrastructures. And also speaking about virtual activities, um, we should uh, reduce them as much as possible and keep them short because sometimes they are too difficult to follow by by the pupils. In terms of lessons learned, I mentioned something throughout the talk. So. Be inspirational, uh, stimulate curiosity, new ideas, also saying some anecdotes, speaking about your own experience. Uh, and you are an outsider in the classroom. You are not a teacher. So you have the possibility um, to work in different ways from the ordinary. Also before it was mentioned something about a role play, for example, that's great. So, and it's, they, they, are all keep, they, they always uh, sit down. So it's good that, to let them stand up, do something, different work build and create something together uh, have work group let the, let them work in teams and, and create something from from scratch with your with your guidance let them speak up so talk about themselves their experience their interests and hobbies and keep uh, take inspiration from that keep that material to bring it into your 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 talk this is good also if you to, to it's good also to survey in advance prior to different activities so that their response could come into into your your less lesson let's say the lecture activity that you propose um, so again here um, virtual tours are not uh, suggested they went well but it's definitely pupils prepare prefer to come on site and if you do them keep them short train both pupils and teachers and uh, yeah, what, what worked was the, the, to stimulate pupils to use all means possible in communicating their the, the results of their project of the project their experience uh, during the experiment using all uh, using their creativity and tools from music to theater to video making to 3d modeling and so on and here of course Teachers are also very important. Their role because um, they, mm, they are a continuation of our work at school, and and it also, of course, depends on their will to to make a good uh, presentation at the end in front of the other classes. But mm, it was really amazing how much the pupils can teach to us as communicators. And um, yeah, and finally, uh, consider whenever we, we do training in the classroom, 
or if they come to us, uh, again, it's not important to, let's say, show off and show how, how many things we know and to transfer only knowledge and notions, but also given their age and the fact that they are going to choose their future, it's important to transfer passion, courage, faith, curiosity, enthusiasm, being em empathetic, empathic and, and listening to them. Um, yeah, here are some uh, replies from, from the pupils. In particular, uh, they, they highlighted the extraordinary experience, the being out of the usual, the fact that uh, it gave some guidance for their future, for their future path. Uh, I think that my time has ended, so I'm yeah. not going to read this, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and here, well, I thank you for your attention. And uh, again, in the case you are involved in similar projects or if you are um, planning to uh, the project, uh, citizen science project, we would be very interested to learn from you or to be involved if we match let's say and um, thank you thank you very much nicoletta thank you very much um so we'll move on to the next speaker who's in the room uh, now that's dr mark basham and he's going to talk about a game which was developed for school pupils so thank you mark perfect so hopefully you can see my screen yeah there we go brilliant um, so yeah, thank you very much, and I would like to thank the organisers for allowing me to present here because it's been, I think it's hopefully it's something that I'm very proud of and that the team who developed it are very proud of. It'll be really excellent hopefully to see what you guys think as well. So um, first off, I should really make my screen work. First off, uh, what is Diamond? So Diamond is the UK's national synchrotron facility. Uh, so I think you've already had loads of talks from synchrotrons um, already, so that's basically the UK's version of this. And uh, we do a whole bunch of different um, scientific experiments, all the way from biology, geology, physics, conservational science, uh, a whole breadth of different, um, different methods. And what is the game? Well, the game is a board game. You can see it here in its glorious um, reality. Um, the idea was that we wanted to create something that could be used un sort of unfacilitated around as a way of engaging with the public and engaging with various different people uh, that didn't necessarily need a researcher to go with it um, and could sort of talk on its own to a certain extent. And so I'm going to sort of overview in this talk, I'm going to go through a few of the lessons learned and tips and highlights from the project. Uh, however, there is loads of stuff that I'm not going to have a time to go into. And we've just published a paper on this that we are very, very proud of and contains lots of detail on all of the decisions we made. And as I say, I'm just going to go into a few of them here but please do take a look at the paper if you have the opportunity. So the first lessons learned, so I'm a researcher, I work at the Rosalind Franklin Institute and at Diamond, uh, and Claire Murray and Matthew Dunstan, who are the other people who worked on the project are also researchers. So I went very much cap in hand to the communications department at Diamond and said, please kind of make a board game. And they went, go on then. Um, but actually one of the first questions, what I was thinking at that point was that I wanted to make an epic game that would be played over the, the course of a weekend with my mates and would involve all the exciting things like peer review and funding streams and all this stuff. Um, but that wasn't really the audience that Diamond was necessarily looking for. And so it was interesting to actually go back and think about what that audience was and who's the game for. So Diamond has a very specific policy. It's looking at later secondary school children. So we kind of targeted specifically school children in secondary school. And that gave a lot of really interesting limitations that we had to take into consideration for the game, such as, well, you've only got an hour, probably 50 minutes to play this game. So of that, by the time you've introduced it, got them to actually play and tidy up, this really shortens the amount of time. So my six hour epic, unfortunately, hit the, uh, hit the floor at that point. Uh, but really important because judging who your audience is correctly can make it significantly uh, fail if you don't hit it correctly. The second one which we found was really important was what's the message and this kind of relates to what I was talking about there. We, I wanted to hit everything, we really paired it back to try and hit the key things and actually we talked to the secondary school staff and they said to us that one of the biggest problems they had was addressing STEM careers. Um, actually, careers have a, a double-edged bonus in that it's not really, it is part of the curriculum, but careers advisors often have separate opportunities to talk to the kids that don't have to be directly curriculum involved. So it's actually a lot easier for them to take the kids off and do something different for an hour 
as opposed to working with the science teachers who have to then specifically work out where synchrotrons fit in the curriculum for them to be able to play the game. So actually that was quite a, a benefit we think and targeting careers was really useful. Um, we also wanted of course to talk about the breadth of work done at Diamond and actually also relate that to science in everyday life because Diamond is very different from sort of the fundamental research, fundamental science research and sort of you know parts of the universe. It's very much more about pharmaceuticals and better designs for things, you know, better materials. So we wanted to relate that into science in everyday life. And the other thing was that we looked at some of the, the um, literature around the area and, and one of the things that came up a lot was that school children don't have the great impression of the fact that as scientists you fail 90% of the time, if not 99% of the time. And actually collaboration is really important. It's not all about a single scientist who is the genius behind everything. It's actually massively collaborative, all the work we do. So bringing in failure and collaboration were really important. And that was pretty much it for the message. We tried to constrain it to those very, very few topics to make it nice and clean. So the next thing we wanted to do was extend the reach. And I really enjoyed the talk this morning, the keynote about actually how you involve EDI in this. So, uh, there's a lot of this in the paper. We spent a lot of time really trying to uh, address as much as we could how people would use the game. So the, the tokens that you can see on the left hand side are the avatars that you have. Um, now, there were loads of things we could have done with this. Uh, so if you take games like um, Pandemic, they've got beautiful artwork. And we we're trying to think of how we would get decent representation. And in the end, we decided that the best way of representing people was as completely amorphous sort of meeple because that way the person who was playing could put their own their own kind of concept on top of that rather than being forced into something and so hopefully that means there's no barrier to them choosing that particular career because of the fact that it was had a you know a female or a male uh, icon or person associated with it uh, you'll also notice that it's very very high contrast this is because so we worked with various people with visual impairments so i have color visual uh, I'm trying to say not colorblind because it's not the correct term anymore, but I can't remember what the correct term is. Uh, but I'm colorblind, so there's a lot of games that I can't engage with because purple and blue are too close, yellow and green are too close, and it's very complicated. So we deliberately tried to make sure that one, it was all super high contrast. The cards themselves were as big as we could make them sensibly with very, very minimal amounts of information on them. And that if we ever used colors, as you can see by the science symbols on the right, we also matched it with a symbol as well. So it was clearly, there were multiple things that, that brought this through. And so that was kind of really important to try and make it as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. So that we didn't immediately discount anyone from playing the game or at least immediately turn people off to it. And the last one was to make it fun. And it's a game. We really wanted people to enjoy playing it. And so what was an excellent, sorry, I should say that a lot of the EDI element was brought to us, uh, was brought through Claire and the work that Claire did. Uh, she was very, very a uh, high advocate of that. Uh, in terms of play testing and making it fun, this is where Matt Dunstan, who's uh, who developed games um, a little bit more than the rest of us, um, was brilliant because he was very keen on us play testing heavily. And so we made prototypes, we printed them out and being at Diamond was very convenient because we were able to play test the game repeatedly every lunchtime. We brought different groups of people in, we got loads of feedback. And we probably play tested the game with about 50 or 60 different people before we even let it touch uh, one of the school children effectively uh, to play it, just to make sure that it was actually fun to play. And one of the really, really fun bits about it, which I personally enjoy, is the experiment cycle. The idea is that you try and get these ticks to complete experiments. And um, it was actually brought in because of the idea of talking about failure. So it's a push your luck mechanic. So you can continue turning over cards for as long as you want. If you get one failure, well, that's OK. You can keep going. But if you get two failures, then you immediately have to stop and you lose half the ticks you've accumulated so far. So one, it makes it quite fun because people really do like the push your luck. You can kind of get there. Uh, but also it introduces the fact that pretty much everybody, every turn has to deal with the fact that they are going to fail. But it doesn't stop you playing the game. It doesn't mean someone doesn't win. It's just something that happens. And it's something that we did pick up multiple times that people got the idea of yeah, failure happens, but it's not the end of the world, which for us was really important. And then the last, last lesson we learned was evaluation and that being really important. So um, we really wanted to make sure that we could evaluate in a nice way. Uh, my wife is a secondary school teacher and she gave us an idea, which was, was really good 
which was just to put a, an A3 sheet of paper in the middle of the, the table for each of the tables that were playing the game. And when we had the kids work on it, the first thing they did was with a blue pen, they marked the questions or they, they answered all the questions and we took the pens away. And at the end of the session, we gave them a red pen and they answered them again. And it just gave us a reasonably easy way of collating information in a very anonymous way of getting all of this information back from them. And it was that evaluation that we did. So we originally did this on 222 students. So we, we went to a few different schools. We had people coming in for open days. And that allowed us to actually bring together some results to see if it worked. And actually, from our point of view, it really, it really was worth it. So from the 222 players we had, the thing that I really like about it is that none of them really liked science more after playing the game. And actually, that's fine because it's a half hour game. It's not going to completely shock your world into liking science. But what we did see a significant and above statistic um, improvement on was the number of them that said that they then saw science in their day to day life. They then understood a little bit more about that. And the one we particularly liked was the 37 percent increase. So this is of the people who said they weren't interested in being a science or engineer. 37% of them changed their minds and said they would want to be a scientist or engineer after playing the game. We think that's partially because they just saw the diversity of different careers we showed them and maybe some of those careers they hadn't considered as being STEM careers and so didn't really think of them as being science based. Mm -hmm. So that was th these were the things that were really good for us. And when we saw these results, we thought, OK, well, <coughs> that's really nice, but OK, we, we've done this with 220 students. Is there any way that we can do more? And so that was when we, that was the big challenge was how can we broaden the reach? Well, the idea originally was the board game could just be given to someone and they could play it. But what we wanted to do was therefore mass produce it and simplify it. And to do that, we worked where we uh, applied for an STFC Spark Award, uh, which we very uh, appreciatively got. Uh, they suggested we work with the Wonder Initiative, which is all about hitting low um, science capital schools and areas with low, low science capital which is perfect. So uh, what that enabled us to do was we worked with a few really great people. Uh, so for example, Paul Grogan on the right, who runs a, a gaming uh, explainer YouTube channel. He created us some explainers for the game. Uh, we worked with Alicat Gamer Media Gold, which produced the actual physical board game itself. And uh, this was all going brilliantly and we kicked this off. And um, now we have finally manufactured these different games. Uh, we've got them out and we've sent them around to 100 schools around the UK. So we've got a reasonably good spread all the way up as far as Edinburgh, I think, and down as far as Jersey um, and a reasonable smattering around. There's still a few schools that I haven't marked on here because I haven't received them yet, but it's pretty much all completed. And it's really nice because it means that hopefully th for each of the schools, they've got a class pack, which is eight of the games. So they've got enough for a whole class of 30 to play the game with a few spares so that hopefully they can reuse it in the future. Um, that also came with class packs, so sort of um, examples of lesson plans and links to the video so that they could work out what to do next. So actually, I, this is a little bit disjointed because actually when we started manufacturing the game, it was just before the pandemic and Brexit. And interestingly, they both had some significant impacts on the game because we manufactured it in Poland. Uh, it turned out to be more complicated than we hoped and the pandemic was not great. Um, so actually, it is a really big second challenge. And I think as a lot of us have found, the pandemic was incredibly challenging, especially for educators, but it did give us the opportunity to look at pivoting. And one of the things we thought was, well, could we redesign the game? Yeah, we really wanted to make it physical because that gave us a lot of control. But actually, could we redesign it and make it into a print and play version? The idea being that people could then just download it and they could play it wherever. You could address, you know, um, not necessarily classrooms, but you could also just get individuals who are interested and wanted to play with their family or clubs or groups. Also, you can go worldwide with this relatively easily because it's, it's virtual. However, it did require a big redesign because what we didn't want is all of our glorious high contrast black backgrounds would be terrible to print. Mm -hmm. um, and so we wanted to redesign everything so it fitted on A4, mm -hmm. uh, redesign the cards. So instead of nine cards to a page, we got 16 to a page, so it was less, less to print. So we had to compromise on a few of our the things that we really wanted, but fundamentally the game was, was there. It also gave us the opportunity to produce a slightly uh, sort of easier version for which was suitable for kind of five plus age categories, uh, which removes a few of the cards 
uh, gives you a slightly simplified version, but still gives you a lot of the, the interest points. So how did this one work out? Well, actually, uh, this was really good. So we pushed the media engagement with our communications group and we got it out to a lot of places. This is the results from uh, about uh, a year ago. I'm very sorry because I haven't updated my graphs for a while, but this was just after we did the main push for it. And because when we asked them to download the game, we got them to fill in a questionnaire up front, um, it meant that we could address where things were coming from, where we were getting you know, across the country in the UK and also across the world, where we were getting data from, who was collecting it and how many people they were roughly going to play with. Um, and we were really, really, um, we were really happy with the impact that it had. And we've got a few feedback from various people who said that they printed it, enjoyed playing it and stuff like this. Um, it also means that it's slightly easier as a print and play to produce. So in fact, one of the things we did was we got a whole load of these sort of very nice versions of the game printed up, you know, properly on nice paper, but you can give these out and these are pretty cheap to then distribute. So if anybody who's here would like one, I'm looking at you guys, okay. um, then you're more than welcome to grab some copies uh, from me if you think it'd be useful. Um, so ultimately, that was pretty much the, the end of everything. Um, the only thing I would say is that it, it took us about five years to go from the beginning to the end of this process. It was quite long. We made a lot of decisions along the way. They're all detailed in the, the paper. The paper doesn't cover the print and play. We're, we're working on that. Um, we're doing a second paper for all the print and play work. Uh, but it was a huge team. So Claire, Matt and myself were, we did the initial design work. But then it was really about all of the groups we worked with. So Evin, David, Isabel, um, Sophie Palmer from SDFC, Laura Holland from the uh, Rosalind Franklin Institute all helped us and started putting the group together. In fact, at the very beginning, we had loads and loads of play testers. Uh, as I say, being at the Institute was great for bringing in play testers. But then we did hire out specific professionals like Paul Grogan, Brett Gilbert, Chris Matthews did all of the design work. Um, we had some various schools that were involved. One final point, I'm going to push my luck on time. Uh, we did data analysis is really hard. So my background is data analysis, but we still needed some summer, uh, summer students, work experience students who helped us collate all of the results and take those sheets and put them into spreadsheets so that we could actually analyze the data and extract the, the data. So uh, there's a lot of stuff there. And of course, just Diamond and STFC funding uh, at the end. And I'm going to leave this slide up for a second so people can grab the, um, the DOI for the paper if you want. Um, and one final, final point. Uh, we wrote the paper with Research for All, which absolutely was an amazing group to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, the editorial team and the reviewers really made the paper better. And actually, as a researcher, um, these papers are incredibly easy to promote and get really good altmetric scores on. So as a researcher who you don't necessarily want your, your researchers always say, well, I can't do public engagement because it's not publishing papers. Well, mm -hmm. you can publish on it. Research for All is a great place to do that. And Actually, it's it's a pretty you know it's it's a big impact paper for me, which is great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to go to the final speaker of this session, which is Avik Dasgupta, who is online with us. Now, keeping in mind, we would like to have some time for questions. If you can try to keep to the time allocated, that would be wonderful, Avik. Thank you. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, just uh, let me know if you, if this is- We can see your visible. slides, yeah. Okay, fine. So uh, today I will speak on uh, how just uh, after schools were reopened after almost one and a half year, mainly in the rural uh, villages of India. Uh, we conducted uh, 15 astronomy workshops and uh, uh, in between there was a COVID wave. So how we uh, you know, played and how we uh, took our hurdles as opportunities and learned something. Okay, so like going ahead, I would just uh, introduce uh, VACC for a minute and then uh, the chronology of the workshop and then going ahead to uh, our learnings. Okay, so uh, VACC or Vikram Sarabhai Community Science Center was established by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, who was uh, the uh, father of space science research in India. And the idea was to uh, 
give people, common people, a field where they can come and interact with science. It can be anybody, and uh, which is denoted in our logo. So basically, teachers can be educationists, it can be scientists, it can be community, it can be students. And uh, you can, uh, anybody can come, you, uh, anytime they can come and they can uh, interact. So the, there was a bit in the previous slide where you can see a children playing, the whole playground, science playground concept was introduced uh, well uh, about 50 years ago by our institute in India. So uh, going ahead, I would just start uh, briefing about the astronomy workshop. So we received uh, uh, funding from Coastwine Industries uh, to do astronomy workshops around in Gujarat. It's a state in India and uh, we have to do it in 15 such schools. So we just uh, go ahead with uh, what are the features of this workshop. So these were one day workshops in uh, rural and underprivileged schools. Uh, 50 selected students from the schools uh, got the chance of uh, going through these workshops, mainly of standard six to eight. And two teachers were also present, mainly uh, of the math science teacher. Each of the primary schools, primary government schools, in India, have one maths and one science teacher who got this opportunity. Uh, not only lectures, but we, we focused on, on interactive sessions and hands-on activities uh, through low-cost activities. And I will, as and as I go uh, in the presentation, sorry, uh, I would explain it much how, what are the hands-on activities. And uh, we uh, also, wherever possible, wherever uh, the night was clear and the local situations were uh, enabling us, uh, we did night sky observations using telescope and binocular or unaided observations, just naked eye observations uh, for the students. Uh, broad learning concepts which we uh, wanted to give them uh, was introduction, a basic introduction to astronomy, uh, hierarchical structures starting from solar system and going beyond uh, basics of optical telescopes and binoculars, how they work, how, how they do it, and uh, understanding some of the astronomical phenomena like moon phases, daily sun's motion, uh, these things through activities. Uh, so for this, uh, we for where after we got our funding, we first made to uh, popularize the whole concept. We uh, did some posters, and uh, this is in bilingual, this English and Gujarati, which is the state language of Gujarat. Uh, we uh, we send it to schools, and from schools, their expression of interest were asked for, and they sent us expression of interest. Out of that. We made a panel and we selected 15 schools based on different criteria, uh, which uh, are uh, based on where they are, whether uh, how, how is the school was functioning earlier in science and mathematics and all these things. Uh, because these are government schools, these are rural schools, we need uh, permissions uh, from the school. Uh, there are block level schools, uh, resource. Yes. So we made something called a permission letter from them. So this came in. Uh, they, each school was supposed to send uh, these permissions so that uh, there could, uh, the workshops could take place in their schools. Then uh, we had uh, registrations. Uh, we did the feedbacks, uh, we did the feedbacks for our workshops. We gave some materials to them post workshop, and I will show those. Uh, for those, we took acknowledgement from them and we collected parts. These are banners and stickers. Uh, for the workshop, this is the schedule. I will also explain the sessions as we go in in a day. So we first went to the schools and uh, what we did first is uh, to introduce to the astronomy concepts went into to explain a bit of stellar evolution and celestial bodies, which are different celestial bodies. We uh, did an activity on solar projector. So I would uh, rather tell you 
so th these are all low cost activities which we build from papers because uh, these schools um, uh, these are very rural schools and implementing there uh, we need uh, things which can be transported and taken off to these schools so the weight the costing of each activity everything matters so we built in such uh, paper based activities uh, template based activities so here you see the sundial uh, it's a horizontal sundial if uh, it's an active horizontal sundial this is a moon phases model and this uh, is basically a telescope uh, model um, it's a working telescope model and we call it box telescope the solar projector which shows you uh, the movement of sun uh, based on the time so the, the basic sense of rotation of earth can be imparted to them using these uh, this uh, sun projector so uh, we we tried to go through these things step by step as and as it uh, it was possible in the whole day and uh, after the workshop post workshop so that they could uh, not leave at the point of workshop or they can go ahead with their learnings we gave them uh, our solar system so this is in gujarati tapru surya mandal uh, we gave them this uh, booklet so that uh, they can continue their uh, learning post workshop too and uh, so these are some of the glimpses from the workshop uh, probably i will show some of these so this is uh, they are making the sun projector the here it is the moon phases model here uh, my colleague is showing them the star chart so he is uh, showing him stell stellarium uh, here you can see the students making sundials uh, here we are explaining uh, what uh, what is a basic telescope and uh, what are the different types of telescopes uh, we have and uh, how to use them what what is the difference between these uh, and how they work you can see in this picture we are actually explaining from the base this students uh, they have they have read about reflection and refraction but uh, what what they, to show them using a laser light and a mirror is a very different experience and you can see from their face, um how they are uh, taking that here you can see this girl uh, and the whole batch making a um, uh, telescope and in that school itself they are actually the moon was in the afternoon side so they could uh, see through those telescope uh, how uh, the different portion of the moon had uh, we uh, made sure that even though the night observation couldn't happen we took uh, binoculars and solar filters so that at least these students can see uh, sun spots and uh, we also made sure that beyond these 50 students all the whole school is being involved in that in a way apart from that where it was possible to clear skies and local arrangements we uh, we did a night sky observation uh, if the telescope was not possible we did an unaided observation it is we are showing some constellation moon uh, this is introductory lecture uh, on the planets and solar system this is against telarium this is the sunspot observation and this is students using this telescope which they have made uh, during the workshop uh, okay so we host a workshop we uh, also gave uh, materials to the schools so that uh, the schools don't stop there and we uh, the schools can you know go ahead because these students will probably go to the next uh, school or next class and they will go ahead after 2 3 years they will move out of school but the school is there so so they can uh, they can keep uh, these uh, those two teachers who were trained at the same time the workshop they can keep going on to other students so uh, this is a uh, optics kit so they have different template based models in this uh, this is uh, poster sets on mathematics Science, different scientific principles, including astronomy. 
he uh, explicitly gave uh, some of the astronomical posters which uh, showed them different. Here you can see Pleiades, and there are different uh, astronomical objects which give them an exposure because um, the schools we are talking in there, uh, even, the even the internet is a remote test. I, with now with uh, phone and all, it's still okay, but uh, it is not very prevalent in internet services. So to give an exposure to them to uh, astronomy, we gave these posters. Uh, we gave some of the reading materials to the schools uh, also, and we provided so that uh, some of the students, if they if they really want to go ahead and take up astronomy, we saw we thought of certifying them that uh, they have attended a workshop and uh, they have gone through a bit of understanding. So to to tell you uh, probably a. Uh, uh, a success story. Uh, this we recently went to monitor how these schools are doing uh, post the workshop, and this guy came up to me and he said, "I want to be an astronomer." So uh, it was probably a proud moment for me as an educator uh, that if I can even at least one person can be that. So these are some of the materials which I've just shown uh, to present it to the schools. Uh, now, uh, everything was going fine uh, around from December, we started and uh, December 2021 and uh, by January 15, it was all good. But then uh, the third wave came in in India and uh, almost overnight, everything was uh, partially locked down, especially schools again went into lockdown. Uh, students obviously felt major jolt because the exams were in, they were sent again home and online education in such uh, regions, as I have already mentioned, is very difficult. So uh, we, we had a plan of uh, making this online and, uh, you know, carrying out the workshop online. We could send these materials because these are paper-based. We, we were planned, we were prepared for these things. But um, then uh, what we thought to do is rather take higher schools. We had some of the schools which are, uh, which are uh, higher secondary schools. That means 9, 10, 11, 12. And vaccinations were, um, were rolled out till then at that point. So we took these schools. Uh, one of the example you see here, if you know Gandhiji, so one school he has built for tribal students across the Gujarat, it's in Ahmedabad itself, but um, this uh, school we took and they were all vaccinated and we could uh, do the workshop there. But apart from this, almost one, uh, one and a half months, we had to sit idle because uh, of the COVID, uh, third wave. And, we, we, uh, and uh, we didn't want to do it online because uh, in the last one year, the previous year, we knew what are the challenges of online uh, education, especially in these rural areas are. Okay, so um, going ahead, uh, we also tried to, as I said, we also tried to move beyond these 50 students because uh, almost all the cases, 90% of the cases, uh, even the teachers have not seen a telescope or binocular, uh, at least a telescope in their uh, time and used it to see our celestial objects. What we uh, did is, to, uh, whenever we go to this school, this example is when we, we went to the school and we told, uh, okay, we will, we will let all the students, there were almost 800 students, we will let all the students to see sunspots uh, through them. So my colleague here is uh, actually showing them one by one. Uh, I am training. Uh, I am training uh, those students. Parallel activity, but we enjoyed a lot because uh, students uh, were uh, more hugely enthusiastic in uh, because they were seeing something for the first time. Uh, so it was a nice experience. This is. Uh, one. In these two cases, uh, we did night observation and uh, in these villages, obviously, if the teachers are not, uh, 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 they have not seen a telescope, so the community, the common folk, 
will never see something like that. So uh, we actually uh, permitted these 50 students and some of the uh, parents uh, uh, villages to come and to join us for the night sky observation. And uh, one thing was that uh, I can share some of the good things. One thing was due to the community participation, uh, safety at night when I do this program at such rural places, is, uh, actually we don't have to see because the community is participating. So the whole village knows that there is something happening. The, even the panchayat, that means the head of the village, he also or she also can come and help you out at that point. Commun involving community was actually a good idea and uh, uh, we got much help from that. Uh, at cases we didn't have a uh, pollen, so they could, they would probably come and give you a shawl or something. You will not feel that much cold. Okay, so... Uh, Abhi, Abhi, yeah. we've got one minute left. Right, I will uh, probably in the end. So this is my uh, map of uh, the schools covered. It's a hundred kilometer radius. These are the different uh, uh, schools we have covered. So the direct reach was scheduled at 70 students, around 50 students, but we uh, went above and beyond and we did around 900 students of that girls were much higher compared to the boys participation. Uh, teachers almost we have trained uh, in double in numbers. So we did a feedback analysis for the feedback forms and it was uh, nice to have good feedbacks in almost all the uh, criteria what we have kept. And uh, next is some written feedbacks which uh, we I have mentioned here. Um, uh, the most I think beautiful thing is uh, they enjoyed to see the star and sun and things. Okay, so these are some media coverage uh, which we got across uh, Gujarat. So the learnings for us was uh, to be flexible and evolving with every point uh, in content and language and delivery. Uh, equipped to respond to changing situations, especially post COVID, uh, ready for hybrid online any situation, any cases. Involvement of community, I would say, uh, is was a major learning. And uh, lastly, I think we can bring change how people look up to stars uh, that we really understood. And uh, this, I would finish with this picture. This uh, school had only, you can see two rooms here. They had only two more rooms. And I have trained 50 students in this school. I'm actually um, very excited of the fact is all these students are so excited. I finish my talk here and I uh, open it for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our speakers this afternoon. We have some time left for questions. So if anybody has any questions, then please do uh, let me know and point them to whoever, whichever speaker you would like to. There's none so far on the chat, although I will point out in case somebody hasn't seen on the chat, Mark has kindly shared the links to the, the game so that people can find it easier from the and then from the sides. Yeah. Any questions anybody has? That's from my side. I yeah, have some ahead. questions, but well, <laughs> I wouldn't make one. Uh, this is for, for Tamari. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. Uh, you say that uh, uh, the students and the teachers uh, change their interest in the, uh, the different uh, uh, material, uh, uh, different things that you talk, that you um, say in the in, in the um, in the journal. So, do you have uh, any way to to check the, the current interest? Of the of the teachers and the students just to select which article could have more impact. Or, Sorry, so, what were you saying? Yes, uh, I will try to changing the yeah, interest. Yes, uh, I think you say that the interest of the students and the teachers change from time to time. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I think <laughs> the, one of your slides. And I wonder if you have any way to 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 detect that changes or um, to. I, I, I don't remember making that point, but okay. I'm sure the interests of students and teachers do change from time to time. Yeah. The main the main way we can monitor this is sort of looking at the Google Analytics for the site. And this is the yeah. advantage of being online only. We can see how the you know how the articles are used, how many times they're accessed, what how long people spend on the pages. And then another way, I should point out, we only mentioned teacher's interest because although the understand articles are intended to be used in the classroom as well, we, we address the teachers. And then if the teachers take our material into their classrooms, that's what they do. We're not, we're not looking to address students directly. But another, another way we can get some kind of indication of teacher interest is of course, um, requests to translate. These are mostly teachers that are doing this. And obviously, if a teacher is motivated to translate an article, it's because they think it's really helpful for the, the colleagues in their countries. Um, how, how do you measure the, the impact of an article using also Google Analytics or? So we, we don't attempt to measure impact on an individual level in the same way that a journal publication would. We don't have citations or anything like that. So it's a very different, yeah. a very different, different approach. We do attempt attempt to sort of more broadly look at what articles are being used, mostly from the Google Analytics, and and what what articles are being used more and what articles are being used less. So for example, we noticed that the previous main way of getting the IROS research results involved, these sort of news articles were not being used very well, so we've moved away from those. But this is this is a very, a very important and interesting question. And if anyone has any ideas on how to do this better, I'm very happy to hear them. I ask because it's one, one thing that maybe a researcher uh, is interested if you approach to a researcher and and propose uh, uh, to to write a, an article for for the journal. Probably they ask, uh, well, what, what, which is the impact of this journal? Or uh, well, or, it's 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 not that's... a journal in that sense. It's but perhaps a better name for it is magazine. This word journal is confusing okay. because we don't publish teaching research; we publish teaching resources. Yeah. So then, okay. so so the, the the authors, the scientists, don't get any direct career credit for it. Some of them will have because of their funding, they have a communication or outreach requirement, and it can count towards that. For PhD students, it's something really nice to put on their CV, and it opens up some of their options afterwards. But it doesn't have that they they can't count impact factor points from it because it's not a journal in that sense. And not not only to PhD, also for researchers that apply for. For contract, yeah, it's also yeah. interesting for Thanks. Thank you, um, Tavash. Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, out of uh, curiosity, I would like to ask also from uh, Tamarin that uh, what is the average views on the articles and what was the highest um, views on the most popular article? I'm gonna go and search for that because I, I, I kind of. Was just asked to talk a little bit of, about content. I thought the focus would be on the on the redevelopment, but let me just go and see if I can find that. In the meantime, I saw another question in chat. Should I answer that while I'm searching? Uh, if it's also directed at you, that's great. I, it's it's directed at it. me too, which is that do you have to be a researcher or current scientist to write an article, or do you publish scientists pu articles from science communicators too? So we don't, you don't, you certainly don't need to be a researcher. I mean, it's you need to have some knowledge about what you're writing about. A lot of our, a lot of our authors are teachers, not scientists. We do have sort of people who are then, we do have comms teams getting involved in this and people who are interested in, in science communication for themselves, for doing their, their blogs and things. We don't have so many articles from professional science writers, mostly because we have a very limited budget for commissioning these. And um, so then we're mostly helping kind of non-professional writers to write something, and we contribute quite a lot of a lot to that, which is sort of then partly justifies that they're, they're not getting paid for it. But we do occasionally have some budget for commissioning for commissioning articles on a particular topic if we need it from science writers. 
Um, can we maybe go to other questions and I'm going to try and dig up the Yeah, sure, no problem. Did anybody have any questions for other people other than Tamara? Um, yeah, you. Mark? Uh, so it's a quick question, or I, oh, I'm going to do this horrible thing of saying it's more of a comment than a question. But Nicoletta, you asked about people who've had citizen science experience. So we've done quite a yes. lot of citizen science from Diamond Light Source and now the Roslyn Franklin Institute looking at our volumetric data sets. And we use the platform Zooniverse, which is the uh, is a UK based one that's that's based out of Oxford, which basically allows you to create projects, kind of open projects. So I'll put the links to it in because Zooniverse is quite a good way of yeah. getting into using citizen science. If you haven't got any experience in it, there's a nice flow that allows you to build things, build things up. And um, we found it super useful because it not only gives you engagement with the the, the citizens who are volunteering, but also because we mainly use it for image processing, it's actually very challenging science to do, especially on bulk amounts of data. So the results we get are brilliantly useful for publishing work as well. Fantastic. Zooniverse, is it? Yeah, I'll put, I'll put a link. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, Tamara, and I was just going to say, um, it, what you've done is amazing. And um, I, so my name is Silvana Westbury. I work for lightsources.org. And um, so I know that there are some synchrotrons within the, um, uh, yeah, you know, know. the group that you're, you're but I, I think it would be, it would be great if you could talk to, to our group, which is communicators from across um, the world, you know, light sources from across the world, because I think that um, uh, the way you kind of organize the information and the way you you get um, the articles and, and work with the um, contributors is a really nice model. So thank you. Oh, thanks. So um, can you can you just um, so this is Silvana West. West. Yeah, I'll just put my um, I'll put my details in the in the chat for you. Um, so we're almost out of time, but uh, Tamash, I think, had, or I don't know, first, but Tamash, did you have another question? For... Uh, yeah, I, I have a question for Avik. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to ask, for example, so how you can fund the, the telescope? So you have some, because maybe I, I missed that, so you have some uh, state uh, funding or, or or for example, you have to buy it by yourself to bring it to schools. Okay, so uh, the lab here uh, has telescopes. Okay. So we have around eight telescopes and we travel with them to the schools uh, for these workshops, especially. Uh, for the telescopes, if you're referring to the template ones, those are in the project. So the, CSR, which comes to us, is part of the project. But the telescope, which is used by students to observe, the high uh, power telescope, uh, we will probably go with the telescope. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 If you really want to know, I can send it to you, but I think I'm not going to get it in the next minute. I'm desperately looking through the, the nope. files because we've rearranged the filing recently. I can nope. pass. Okay. I can pass your email address on to Tamash if that's okay with you, Tamash. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that. I do have this data, but um, I'm just getting flustered trying to find it. That's okay. Not a problem. Okay, then uh, I think we should wrap things up. Thank you to our speakers again. Thank you very much, Tamara and Terry and uh, Nicoletta, Avic and Mark for a very interesting <laughs> And yeah, here in person, there's a short break now, I believe, until 4 p.m. UK time, and then we return for the next uh, lot of sessions then. So Great. enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank Bye. you. You too. Goodbye. Bye. Uh, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.